This is Writing Excuses, Season 5, Episode 22, Film Considerations. It's 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry. And we're not that smart. I'm Howard Taylor. I'm Dan. I'm Wells. Mar- <laughs> Sorry. Dan Wells. Wells. I'm Mary Robinette Kowal. And I'm Dave Wolverton, a.k.a. David Farmer. Well, Dave and Mary, thank you very much for joining us. We're uh, here at Writing Superstars in Salt Lake City, so we've got lots of opportunities for special guests, and we've got uh, Moses Siragar here from, uh, what's the name of the podcast? Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing. Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing, who's uh, videotaping us, and we're chewing into our time limit by talking about that. Dave, give us a quick introduction of you. Of you. Who okay. are you? I am a science fiction fantasy writer who is also writing novels, video games, and in film. So. Excellent. And uh, d- titles really quick for the listeners. We've got uh, the Rune Lord series. Rune Lord is probably uh, the biggest series. And, the, uh, the video game you worked on was Starcraft Brood Starcraft War, one of the biggest War, of all time. And, uh, so. and I'm working on some films, and unfortunately right now they're on titles. So it's <laughs> <laughs> We're not allowed to talk Know what that's that. like. Yeah. Okay. Well, what we want to talk about today is movie considerations. Uh, when you're writing something after you've written something and you're trying to sell it. Uh, Mary, want to start with you. You were talking about a, a Hollywood formula that can work for fiction. Tell us about that. Um, actually, I was going to ask Dave to talk about that. Oh, oh, are that you undermining me on my own podcast? I am <laughs> undermining you on your well, own podcast. Well, that's okay. You can do that. No, the, uh, the interesting thing about formulas is that you can apply them to a lot of different things if you understand why they work. And I was talking mm-hmm. with Lou Anders prior books, and he was talking about the Hollywood formula and how it can, how it can map onto fiction. Um, yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that formulas are not inherently bad for the same reason that a recipe is not inherently exactly. bad. If, if you follow it correctly, it works. If you don't know what you're doing, then it does seem right. it doesn't. And once you know why the formula or the recipe works, you can start changing things and swapping them around. But where you run into problems is what, like if you look at it and go, ah, Harry Potter was successful, so I therefore will write a story about a young wizard who lives under the stairs. That's not the formula. Yeah. All right. Well, so. Okay. Yeah. And there, there are a number of different formulas. And then I, I'm not even sure if I want to call them formulas all the time. Sometimes they're just ideas that help. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, the most common thing you're going to hear about in Hollywood is the three act structure. Okay. I'm um, a big fan of the three act structure. And, and they like to say, you know, you can break the story down into first act, third act, you know, second. Beginning, middle, and end, okay, is a simple way to put it. Um, the beginning, of course, is where we introduce the characters, we introduce the setting, we introduce the conflict, and uh, that's sort of usually the, third, the first act. Um, maybe there's some complications that start taking place, things get worse and worse and worse. That's the second act. The third act is where everything gets resolved in the big climax, and then, of course, we have the day law where the story resolves and everything's brought back to peace, and um, you know, the bad guy is destroyed, and everybody gets their treasure, and uh, fall in love, and we'll have after. You know, that's basically the perfect act structure. Well, what I like about the three-act structure is that once you're familiar with it, when you learn other things like the Campbellian monomyth or trifail cycles, so you can map or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> These map into three act structure just fine. I'm a fan of the three act structure because, as I learned in corporate presentations, the human brain can't hold more than three to five thoughts simultaneously, and so I always well, carve things yours. into three first. I'm not that <laughs> smart, and you're the one who said we're not that smart, and so I stick to it. Fifteen minutes, and we That's only right. have fifteen minutes. But let's talk then about uh, movie considerations specifically with three act structure. How does that help? I mean, it, is that helpful for transitioning your story into a movie eventually? Or I think it. I think it is in a couple of ways. First of all, if you've got a three act structure, you start realizing that your story can't be sprawling, enormous, and complex. Okay, um, your big uh, fantasy tome of three hundred thousand words will not make a ninety minute movie. You know. Uh, Unless you cut out lots and lots of what's going on, so you have to you have to uh, be lean, you have to pare things down, and think in uh, you know okay, I've got I've got eight minutes to introduce this character and the conflict in the world. You know how am I going to do that in eight minutes? So you're going to say if I'm going to be writing a, a book that I want to have transformed into a movie, I might look at a really quick way of how do I get all of that out uh, and get uh, and get my characters going on their uh, on their 
on the journey. Phase. Yeah. And yeah. If, you're if you're trying to time that, my understanding is that uh, most screenplays are spaced and formatted in such a way that it roughly maps to one page per minute. That's right. And so if eight pages into your screenplay you are still introducing characters, it's time to prune. That's right. Exactly right. It seems like uh, you would also want to really consider, really think about what your story is really about. Yes. To make sure that even if there's lots of extra fluff, because a lot of readers love all the extra stuff, that you know at the core, this is what I'm trying to do, and this is what yeah. I'm trying to say. You know, very often they'll meet with an author and they'll say, so what's your book about? And they go, it's, a, <laughs> it's 100,000 words, it's about 100,000 words. I can't put it in anything less. And in Hollywood, they would go, uh, that's not a possible movie. We need yeah. to understand in one line, you know, your tagline, your log line, um, what is this movie about? Give it to me in eight words. Yes, yeah. the way that is often put. And that's something that I've seen a lot of movie pitches, and I think that's something a lot of writers can definitely learn from because they're really quick. You know, the the way we sold my serial killer series in Britain was saying this is Teenage Dexter in an X Files episode, which is that tells you everything you need to know about it. Yeah, exactly. Shades of Milk and Honey is Jane Austen with magic. Yeah. Which doesn't tell you what the story is, doesn't tell you what the characters are, but it is enough of a hook that you instantly know what's going on. It tells you usually the age and the sex of the character. It tells you a little bit about what the tone is supposed to be. It gives you a lot of information really, really quickly. And if you can just you know, sit down and boil it down to that, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's uh, take a really quick break and talk about our book of the week, which is going to be... Uh, David Farland's uh, The Room Lords. Um, it's book four in the series, The Letter of Bones, coming out from, uh, just came out from audible.com. Yep, so uh, head on over to audiblepodcast.com slash excuse. You can kick off a 14-day free trial and uh, have a listen to some uh, yeah. fantastic and if, if, if you have not read the Rune Lord series, the first three books are also on Audible, that's, so that's you can correct. start with the first one, which is just called The Rune Lords, correct? Right. And, and it's a fantastic series with a really... I think, ingenious magic system that delves into a lot of moral issues that's it's very and, cool. And the good thing is book four stops at the first big arc, so you've really kind of got a great, a great resting place for the series. Yeah, so Mary, let's uh, let's come back to the question that Dan originally handed to you. Right, uh, this, this, you know, no, that's fine. this discussion of formula, um, a, a particular film writing formula that you found worked well for fiction writers? Well, this, this was the thing that I thought was very interesting from the conversation I had. He described uh, in, in the Hollywood formula that he was describing, he said that... That's Lou Anders? Lou Anders, yeah. He said that there's the, um, there's the, the protagonist, your hero of the story, there's the viewpoint character, there's your antagonist, and then there's the, the conflict, the problem. Um, and that for the first part of the story, what you're doing is that you are introducing the protagonist and the problem and that up to a certain point you can keep adding problems and then you have to start solving them. And when you get to the end, and this was the part that I was like, ah, this is why so many endings in fiction, I've seen like the dismount fail. That the closer you can come to having, the, um, the viewpoint character is like the buddy and there's frequently a conflict between them. So the closer you can come to at the ending to having the Protagonist and the viewpoint character resolve their differences, defeat the villain, and solve the problem. The closer you can have them happening uh, in time, the more of an emotional impact will have. And I was working at the time. I was working on a novel, and I had the viewpoint characters resolve, and I I had them solve the problem in another chapter. I had them defeat the villain in a third chapter, and it was I was and I could tell that it was misfiring, but I couldn't tell why. So I went back and I was like, well, let me see if I can actually make this happen all in one chapter. And everybody that I've handed that to, that piece of work to weeps at the ending, which is the first time that I've had that happen quite that consistently. That's great. Right. There's uh, now one place where I think Hollywood often gets this wrong mm -hmm. is the shootout. Yes. You know, and that's something they'll have all the character problems resolved. And then they'll end with a shootout yes. or a chase scene, which is kind of their way of going out with a bang, and yet always feels hollow. Yes. And I see that creeping into 
to fiction, creeping into books a lot. I mean, a lot of the things that we see in movies are coming more and more into books. And so, what are some ways that we can avoid doing that? Well, I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons that that happens, the, the reason it feels hollow and, and cheating is because they have not sufficiently motivated the characters to make that a natural place, that it's forced. And that's a case where you are catering to the formula rather than making sure that the, the characters are driving. Um, in, in puppetry, we call this uh, muscle, that the idea that, that things are moved from within rather than being moved by external forces. And I think a lot of times when an ending, when, when that sort of thing happens, it's because you can see the filmmaker's hand. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's true. You know, I try to look at it in terms of emotional movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, know, you can walk across a room, but you can also change how you feel about things. Yeah. So, for example, I could go from, you know, really despising her, and then upon meeting her and getting to know her for five minutes, say, well, I think I'm in love. <laughs> you know? Um, and so, That's what most of us do. So we work really hard to see emotional movement in your story. And if you think about in those terms, those problems will start dropping away. Mm -hmm. At risk of reducing this to uh, first grade ed, it's the why did the chicken cross the road joke. Yeah. To get to the other side is a funny punchline because we are all expecting justification That's right. and not getting it. Mm -hmm. And when you write your novel, the chicken bloody well better have a reason to have gone to the other side of the road. Yes. Otherwise, it was the filmmaker's hand picking up the chicken yes. and moving it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now, we don't have uh, a lot of time left, but uh, one of the things that we wanted to hit here were some movie considerations in terms of you've already written something, a book or a short story. Um, Dave, you said when we were, were planning this out that sometimes within a week of a short story coming out, a uh, zealous movie agent will contact you and say, all right, I want to buy the rights to this. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some things to keep in mind when that happens? First of all, um, when you have a producer, you know, you don't just take anybody who says, I'm a producer. You know, don't take them at their word. Go find out what their credits are, if they're capable of making this movie, and if they have any real money. If they're willing to invest real money in it and, and give you money, then uh, they're a little bit more credible than the guy who says, I don't have any money, uh, you know, I, but I, have, I know everybody in Hollywood, I work with all of them. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, I'll just because you are numbers. a new writer does not mean you need to settle for a student filmmaker. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. There are people in Hollywood called uh, Golden Retrievers whose job it is to go and get the rights to stories um, for nothing. And then big producers will then come in and find out, wait a minute, uh, I really had a, a huge producer behind this and I just got screwed. You know, yeah. So you don't want to find yourself in that position. So don't sign anything, don't make any agreements, talk to your agent, talk to somebody who works in the Hollywood industry a little bit, um, do your own research online, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I was about to say rule one, uh, get the money first, but I think yeah. the real rule one should be get an agent first, or an entertainment lawyer, someone that knows the business that you can consult with. Absolutely. Rule two then is don't do anything for free. Make sure that you have money before you uh, before you sign anything. And, and never take anything on the back end, okay? Yeah. You always take it on the front end in Hollywood. There's long reasons behind this, but I don't have time to explain it though. Well, no, and yeah, and at risk of uh, making meta-commentary here, uh, when you are writing uh, with film considerations in mind, um, often you end up pruning, just as we are mm -hmm. podcasting right now with film considerations in mind. I think we've got 90 seconds in which to hand people a writing prompt and send them home. That's true. Yes. All right, so we are just going to make Mary do this. Give us writing, writing prompt. prompt. Uh, so your writing prompt, thank you for the warning. This is our favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Put um, you on the spot. Your writing prompt is uh, that you need to come up with a tagline for for your novel, your short story, or something that you would like to write but have not yet written. Fantastic. Eight words or less. That sounds good. Excellent. Yes. A tagline. All right, well, this has been Writing Excuses. Thank you for listening. Uh, YouTube fans, let's all camp to the camera and uh, wave. Uh, thank you for watching. You're out of excuses. Now go write.